Hello Cloud Gurus and welcome to part two of this lesson. This part continues immediately from where part one left off. So let's jump into it and get started straight away. So if we refresh this now, we can see that sad.acloud.guru is active. You can see that by the status field, but it's not registered. So the next step is to select the directory and register it for use with workspaces. Now we can just accept the defaults here, but one thing I do want to draw your attention to is as well as enabling the directory for workspaces usage, you have to do the same if you want to utilize WorkDocs. The defaults, yes, and so I'm just gonna leave everything as is and click register. Now it's worth mentioning you can do all of this separately. So you can create the directory directly from the directory services product and then come to the workspaces console and register it that way. Either is good, and you may as well do it as one step if you don't have an existing directory and you're creating a brand new Workspaces installation. Now, as always, this step may take between two to three minutes, so I'll pause the video and I'll resume it once the registration has completed. So we can see this has registered, and it would have been at this point that you would have got the error if you were trying to register a directory with a directory node that is in an unsupported availability zone. So if you do get an error message, you'll have to delete the existing directory, recreate it, and choose an alternative subnet, one that's in a different availability zone. Now, because we only have three availability zones, the number of possible choices are limited. Originally, when I had my failure, I picked availability zone A and C, and I could not register workspaces for this directory. It turns out that in my account, availability zone C in Sydney does not support workspaces. So for this demo, I created one in availability zone A and B, which is this directory that you can see now. And this has registered successfully, so we know at least in my account, A and B, so availability zone A and B, are supported for workspaces. Now once this is completed, we can click on workspaces in the left side menu, and we can launch a workspace. Now you'll be asked to select the directory, in this case, sad.acloud.guru, and then click Next. Now, a workspace is tied to a user of that directory, and I don't have any users yet, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to create one. This will be for me, so I'll enter my username, my first and last name, and then my email address. And once you've entered all that information, you can click on Create Users. And that will create a user in this directory services installation. And it's this user that we're going to create the workspace for. So click next step. And you'll be presented with a number of options for the type of workspace to create. So you'll notice that the two top ones, standard with Windows 7 and standard with Windows 10, are available for use as part of the free tier. In order to keep costs down, I'm going to select the standard with Windows 10. So that's the one with 2 vCPU, 4 gig of memory, and 50 gig of storage. So once that's selected, I'll scroll down, and I'll click on Next Step. And it's here you'll be asked for the billing model. Workspaces supports two billing models. The first is always on, where you'll be charged a monthly fee for access to the workspace, whether you use it for one minute or the entire month. You've also got Auto Stop, which is the one that's free tier eligible, and it's the one we'll be using for this demonstration. With this model, you build by the hour, and if you don't use your workspace after one hour, then that option is configurable, it will stop the workspace, and that simply means that you won't be charged while it's stopped. It does mean that when you attempt to connect to this workspace, it'll take slightly longer while the workspace starts up but it is a very cost-effective way to utilize a product which used to be billed on a monthly basis. You've also got options to encrypt the C and or D drive, but we're going to leave those as default for now. Scroll down and click on Next Step. We'll just review all the information that we've set, and once we're happy with it, we'll click on Launch Workspaces. Now this process will take some time. It can be anywhere up to 45 minutes. It does say 20, but I have seen it take much longer. 
Now, when this is finished, the user of the workspace will receive an email, and that email will contain all of the details required to connect to the workspace. This will include a link to download the client, a unique code which will link the client to this directory services installation, and it will contain your username and other bits and pieces. And there will also be a link to set the password of the user in the directory service for the first time that you use this workspace. So I'm going to pause the video here, and I'll resume it once the workspace is completed and I've received the activation email. So once the workspace is finished, you'll see that the status is available, and you'll have received a registration email. It'll look something like this, and it will contain a few key points. The first is the registration code, and this is how the workspace's client links with your specific directory services instance, and you'll need to enter this once every time you initially set up the Workspaces client. Next is your username, and this is the same username of the user you created in the directory. But before we can connect, we need to set the password of this user, and we'll use the link at the top of the email. So I'm going to copy this link, I'm going to paste it into the current browser, and press Enter and we'll see the existing registration information, so my username, my first name, surname, and my email address. And I'll be asked to set a password. So I'm going to use a fairly complex alphanumeric password with some symbols, and I'll repeat it in the second box and click on Update User. Now you'll only need to do that once, and then you'll be taken to the Download Client screen. And it's here where you can download the Workspace's client for Mac OS, iPad, Windows, and various other operating systems. Now I don't need to do that, I've already got the Workspaces client installed. But if you haven't, go ahead and download it now. You can pause the video and resume once you're ready to continue. When you are ready to continue, start up the Workspaces client and you'll be asked for the registration code. The screen will look like this, and it's in this box that you paste your code. So let me go ahead and get that. And that's this code here. So the registration code. Make sure you don't get any previous or post spaces, so just copy only the code. And then paste that in the Workspaces client and click on Register. And that'll take a couple of seconds, and then you'll be asked for your username and password. So once again, the username is the username of the user you created in the directory. So in my case, this is my username. And the password is the one you set moments ago. So paste that in and click Sign In. You'll be asked if you want to remember your authentication settings, and I'm going to click No. And it's at this point that the Workstation application connects to the Workspace's infrastructure. It performs some application updates, and you'll end up at a Windows 10 desktop. Now, if you're prompted whether you want this PC to be discoverable by other PCs on the network, just answer No. And if you're connected to a workspace that's running in a region close to you from a geographical perspective, you should notice that the workspace is very, very responsive. It's almost indistinguishable from a local machine. Now feel free to start up some of the applications and have a look around, but do just keep in mind that the initial time an application is started up, it might be slightly slower than usual. Everything just needs to be executed at initial time, configuration performed, various bits and pieces cached, and then it will perform very much like a normal desktop. Now specifically for the exam, I want to draw your attention to the networking of the workspace. So let's open the Network and Sharing Center. You'll notice the workspace has two network interface cards. You have a public network interface and you have a domain network. Now let's start with the public network. If I open up this Ethernet connection and I have a look at the IP address, You'll notice it's a 172.31.128.54 address. This may differ when you're running it locally. But the key thing to know is that this is not one of the IP addresses on our VPC. This network interface is one that's managed by AWS. It does not run in your VPC. And it's the network interface that's used for the workspace's client to connect to this workspace.
Now, any bandwidth you utilize on this network interface is not billed. It's not charged to your AWS account. Any bandwidth that you need to and from the workspace is included in the cost of the workspace. Now, this interface is also used for management of the workspace by AWS, and so it's really important not to make any configuration changes. At a high level, just view the public network interface on this workspace as one that's managed by AWS, and you shouldn't, under normal circumstances, change any of the settings. Now, the domain network is the one that's used to connect to other resources inside your VPC. It's the one that's used to authenticate various operations against the directory service. And if you access any network resources, so if you browse the internet or you browse to any internal or VPC AWS resources, it's this interface that you'll use. This interface is billed and any data transfer is charged at the normal AWS rates. This is essentially just a VPC network interface. Now, this interface will be subject to any security or routing rules within your VPC. So this workspace lives in a specific subnet. This subnet has a specific route table with specific routes contained in it. And so the routing configuration of this workspace is directly controlled by the route table that is on the subnet that this workspace is in. And likewise, for this workspace to have internet access, there needs to be a NAT gateway or NAT instance to provide it with this internet access because it's living in a private subnet. It's living in the same subnet as our directory services instances. Now, connectivity to this workspace, as I mentioned a second ago, is via the public network. So this configuration, so configuration of this NIC, the domain network NIC, does not affect your ability to connect to the workspace. Now, it is critical to know that this NIC lives in a single subnet. And as we know, a single subnet belongs to a single availability zone. And this is critical because a workspace by design is not highly available. It lives in a specific subnet, in a specific availability zone. Now, if an availability zone does become inoperable and a workspace is running in a subnet in that availability zone, then keep in mind the directory services and the workspace is able to fail over to the other subnet. And that's why you always configure two subnets. It keeps the platform active with a single AZ failure. Now, from an exam perspective, the only thing you really need to be aware of is this is simply an instance. It's a machine running with a network interface within your VPC. So aside from the ability to connect to this workspace, which as I've mentioned is via this public network and is always available, any network routing or security decisions is based on pre-existing elements of the VPC. So knuckles, security groups, and any routes or route tables that you have applied. Keep that in mind for the exam. It's a critical learning objective. You need to remember there are no specific workspaces configurations in terms of routing. It is simply that it inherits the routes from the route table which it occupies, so within the subnet which it occupies. Okay, and that's really the end of this lesson, Cloud Gurus, at least as far as the scope of the exam goes. Now, I do suggest you go back to the AWS console and have a little bit of a play around with what other activities you can do with workspaces. So experiment with rebooting, with stopping, starting, rebuilding, leaving the workspace idle for one hour so that it auto shuts down and then reconnect to it. So you can just see how the workspace performs. As far as the exam goes, you just need to understand the architecture of the Workspaces product. So which NICs are involved, the fact that it has a directory service as a dependency, limits on Workspaces as a product. So what are the minimum subnet sizes? Same for directory services, for ports, what ports need to be open between the VPC and a Workspace how the security groups are controlled for a workspace. And I'll make sure I put a link on your screen now, which points to a really good set of articles around some of the limits and some of the gotchas around the workspace product. Now, the exam doesn't really focus on workspaces in a major way, but I did see a small number of questions during my exam. So I just wanted to make sure that you had the opportunity to at least spin up a workspace and experience how it works.
Now, if you do have any questions after having completed this demonstration and after you've looked at the link that was on your screen a second ago, then please do reach out directly or via the forums. Otherwise, feel free to complete this lesson and move on to the next. And please do remember to delete your workspace, deregister the directory, delete the directory, and then delete the CloudFormation template for the VPC. And once you've done that, everything that we've created in this lesson will be removed from your account and you won't be billed. Thanks for listening, Cloud Gurus, and I'll speak to you in the next lesson.